What's up, everybody? Wow, man, 11 o'clock service, and it's packed up in here. Amen. PJJ, I think we, we found our niche. Amen. I told my folks right over here, I said, y'all got to keep coming at 11, and if y'all keep coming, that'll be our regular time next month, and then the next month and the next month. So anybody like 11 o'clock service? Yeah. People are really excited about 11 o'clock. Wow. We'll, we'll keep it, we'll keep it uh, like that if you guys keep coming. Now, um, wow, it's good to be here in the morning time. Um, was worship off the hook or what? Now, I was kind of shocked. I, I may be late on this one, but uh, I'm praising God. I'm worshiping God. The presence of God is here. And um, I open my eyes and look up. And I see Rachel jumping and dancing, but she's not singing. It was Chelsea. I was like, that girl could blow. Where's she at? She ain't here? She up there? What's up, Chelsea? Oh, over there. Zach. That's a diamond in a rough right there. She was always so quiet all the time. I was like, I was literally in shock, like, hold up. Because Rachel wasn't moving her mouth. She was just dancing and jumping and shaking. And, you know, Rachel, you know, Rachel from the town. You know what I mean? She was getting down over there. I'm like, this, like, I'm, maybe it's early, you know what I mean? Get this crust out of my eye. And she was just going in the spirit and a prophetic. I'm like, wow, wow, amen. Amen, worship was off the hook. Makes it a little easier to preach. Um, praise God. Well, last time I spoke to the, to the congregation, um, I spoke about the topic, someone needs you. Someone needs you. I'm not sure if some of you remember it, all three of you guys probably, that was actually tuning in. I actually remember and took a couple of notes. Um, but I was pondering on this, this topic, and I want to kind of go into it a little more, but twist it up a little bit as well. Um, I was reminded, I was talking to my boy Hav after the sermon, a portion I missed, and John John knows about this. Like a lot of times as a preacher, you uh, tend to forget things that's not on your notes or it's on your notes you forget to say. And then after the message, you're like, oh, dang, I wish I would have said that. And I want to share with you, I was talking to uh, Hob and he was sharing with me after the sermon and he was, the, the whole idea was for those that weren't here was there's somebody out there that needs you. And we're dealing with the, the parable of the 99 sheep and the one that wanders off and that the shepherd goes and gets the, nine, the one and leaves the 99. And this idea that there's one person out there that could use our help. And I was talking to Hob and he goes, man, that kind of convicted me. I started thinking about this brother and that brother, he started giving me names. And what I want to leave you here today, just from the beginning, just going back from last, the last time, is if you could write that person's name down, that one person. Because the idea is like when you're, I'm sure, just like myself, as I'm preaching, God's convicted me and dealing with me as well. Um, you think of a person like, man, there is somebody that I'm kind of connected to, whether it's in my family, one of my friends that I'm close to that could use maybe a little more love. You know what I mean? Maybe a text message here and there. Right. And so I want to encourage you even right now. Some of you may even have your phones out even now. Just t text that person. Right. Just write that name down. Pray for that person. Do something that you wouldn't usually do for that person. Reach out to them. Go buy them a coffee. Buy them a gift card somewhere. I don't know what it is. But like the, the man of God earlier just said that there's something inside of us. And that's Jesus. And that Jesus wants us to give to other people. Amen. And not to just kind of just have everything for ourselves. Amen. Moving on. Um, so in the last portion of that, of that sermon, I was dealing with... Uh, the, the parable of the lost sheep and the, the shepherd goes and gets the sheep. But what's unique about this sheep is um, when the shepherd finds them, he picks them up. The shepherd finds this lost sheep, picks them up and puts them. The Bible says puts them on his shoulder. And that's a picture of God. Right. And some of us, and I was trying to explain to the church, I'm not sure if y'all caught this or not. This, a lot of times when we think about the parable of the lost sheep, we think of lost people, people that don't know God. But if you're a sheep, hmm, speaking about Christians, because my sheep, what? Know my voice. 
And so in this prayer with the Lord Sheep, a lot of times we, we, we think about people that are like not in church or d- that doesn't know God. But I wanted us to think about this text in the context of us. And how many times have we been, we've been in the church knowing God, praising God, been here lifting our hands, crying at worship, hallelujah, paying tithes, but been lost. Consuming the seat, but wandered way off. And I've been there before. I'm going to be real with you guys. There have been many times I've been in church, saved as I don't know what, but lost. And I know how to do all the Christianese. Hey, how you doing? Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. Like little robots. Church don't keep it real no more. How you doing? I'm, I'm in the pits of hell right now. <laughs> I'm broke. Family's in just broken up and all jacked up. I stepped in poop outside on 6th Street. Locked my keys in a car. This is not my day today. So I'm not good. God is good. I'm not going to ever say he's not. But it doesn't feel like he's good to me right now. <laughs> Can I just keep it real? Can I just keep it real? So God puts us on his shoulders. He puts us on his shoulders when we're lost. But the first thing we have to do, church, is realize that we're lost. Or realize a moment in time where we're, you're just not, you don't have it all together. And can I just say to somebody today, that's okay? It's okay to sometimes not have it all together, not know what Bible verse to quote in this situation. It's okay to not feel like you want to worship God, though everything in you should want to worship God because he's always good. But it's okay in your flesh, come on, can I just be real with you, to not feel like it. But a lot of times we do things that even though we don't feel like it, we got to do it anyways, right? Where my workers at? Amen. Monday's tomorrow, right? You ain't going to feel like going to work. But you sure going to go, amen? Why? Because you want to check. You'll catch that next week. He goes, and the shepherd goes, and he finds the sheep. Such a beautiful picture when you really read this text. He goes, and he's searching for the sheep, and he finds the sheep. There's 99 other ones, right? You would think that he's like, well, I got 99. Forget that one. No, that's my one. If I don't have that one, I'll feel incomplete. Can you, just, can you just imagine that God thinks of you that way? And when you're not on your game and you're, you're kind of wandering off and you're not feeling life and you're not feeling God and he's thinking about you, he's searching for you, and he's, and he's searching diligently. He's seeking you. And when he finds you, he doesn't just say, all right, get back in the game. Like some of our fathers did, huh? Just get get up, boy. Stop crying. Get out there. The loving God that he is, he picks you up, puts you on his shoulders, says, come on, we're going back. Amen. Ain't that good? Someone say someone needs you. Come on. I know it's early, but I hate to state the obvious. I'm the black preacher. I, uh, I hate to state the obvious. I need you to interact with me today, all right? Talk back with me, all right? Holler back at me. I got the hanky right here, amen. All we need is a, uh, what's the, uh, the, with the bells on it? Tambourine, that's all. Where my tambourine at? Shanae, where is that? I know you got one. You probably could download a tambourine app on your phone and shake it a little bit. Here we go. Someone say someone needs you. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew's 11. Matthew chapter 11. It's crazy how the, what we're going to be dealing with today. We're going to be dealing with um, facing trials. It's facing trials. And I feel kind of humbled and 
not worthy to talk about trials when I got a man of God here who's doing ministry in Iran. Like, what, do I, what am I talking about trials when his life is on the line every single day? So if you don't mind just putting some headphones on and just don't pay attention to me. <laughs> I'm not qualified to preach this sermon right now with you in the building, but I'm going to try my best. Matthew's 11 chapter. And we're going to go to the 28th verse. Praise God for the morning service, by the way. More time to preach the everlasting gospel. <laughs> and I think John John's going to regret this later. Because anyone that knows John John, he's a very strategic person. He thinks about everything. There's nothing that's like really unplanned with John John, right? Anybody know John John, right? He's just, he doesn't just do anything, just happens chance. He's like very organized. I think he missed this one. <laughs> to let the black preacher preach the first morning service. I'm going to preach. Thank you, Pastor Elena. I'm going to preach. How many hours I'm going to preach, I don't know. I'm going there, though. We got a lot of time on our hands. And we need a fellowship with our church family. Amen? Why not fellowship in the word? Right? And inside, he's like, oh, you better sit your butt down. Huh? <laughs> Matthew 11, 28. I'm just kidding, man. I'm just kidding. I'm going to preach for two hours. That's it. That's it, two hours, okay. Matthew 11, 28. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Most of you have read this verse before, seen this verse before. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Watch this. Verse 30, for my yoke is what? My yoke is what? My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Someone say, take it easy. <laughs> Look at somebody else and tell them, take it easy. <laughs> Mix it up just a little bit. I, I know you may be irritated already at me, but just, just get used to it. Look at somebody and tell them, it's not that serious. Not that serious. Take it easy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for this church family, Lord, this movement, this kingdom movement that's giving you glory. We're about expanding this kingdom, your kingdom on earth. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're just, you're just always good. I'm just so overwhelmed with your goodness today, God. I pray that this word, your word, would fall on good ground that it would bear fruit, and that someone would go out and do some, something with it. Jesus, it's all about you. Take me out the way. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Someone said amen. 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 Someone say take it easy. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I actually, I'm looking for a response actually on this one. I heard, a, I heard someone say life is like a roller coaster. Can anyone tell me what that person might have meant? When he said life is like a roller coaster, anybody can actually tell me? Okay. Most people, right, says ups and downs, right? Life is a bunch of ups and downs. I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be mean, but you're wrong. That's not the answer. And I was actually shocked because when I answered the question, I answered the same way. It has, uh, life has ups and downs, which is true. But that's not the parable. Life is like a roller coaster, once you get on, you can't get off. Let that sink in just a little bit. You cannot get off until the ride is over. Think about that. Life is like a roller coaster. Once you're on, you can't get off. And I know many times, maybe it's just me, not you guys, because you guys have a good life. The abundant life is so good. There's been many times, get me off! <laughs> Anybody really been on a roller coaster before, like, your first couple of times? 
Hey, he's not here right now. I'm going to get clown on my son real quick. I'm sorry. I got to do this. My son is so scary, man. My five-year-old son, he is scared of his shadow, y'all. He is, I don't know where he gets this from. He ain't getting it from me. I'm tough. He is the guy that gets on the roller coaster and is, get me off, ready to jump off the roller coaster in the middle of the ride. And the thing's going like two miles per hour. It's a little choo-choo train. No, it's okay, man. <laughs> but I ain't gonna lie, I have been in that place before. I, I was scared of roller coaster. I didn't go on my first roller coaster until I was like 14. And I went with my little brother. And I was holding my little brother like, bro, get me off. I'm just being honest. I ain't, I ain't just keep it real. But ain't that a trip? Life is like a roller coaster. Once you get on, you can't get off. So I want to encourage somebody and say, why, why not just enjoy the ride? Someone say, take it easy. Someone say, take it easy. Come on, it's church at 11 o'clock in the morning. You're on the roller coaster already. Just buckle your seatbelt. Come on. And enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. Because with Jesus, he said, you know what? My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Let's think about this a little deeper. Let's go over to uh, James, the first chapter. James chapter, and I think they got the verses up, I think. I was kind of late with getting in the notes, so Brother Jacob, forgive me. Hope it all worked out. James chapter 1, verse 1. Someone say, take it easy. Come on, let's go. James chapter 1, in the, verse, the, the first chapter in the first verse. This letter is from James, a slave of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Some of you heard that verse before, right? Trials and suffering and troubles come your way. Consider it joy. See, this is the type of stuff that people that are not Christians, right? Like, come on, man, this is, this don't even, that don't even make any sense. You lying to yourself. Count it joy when you're going through troubles. And notice what he said, when troubles come, not if, not why, but when. I hate to break the bad news, but it really is good news. Troubles are coming. If not, like John John was preaching a little earlier, they may already be here right now. You might be in your seat right now in the midst of a trouble, a trial. But he said, count it joy because it's an opportunity. It reminds me of Jesus in Hebrews. Some of you may be familiar with the passage. For the joy that was set before him, he did what? He endured the cross. That's quite interesting. What do you mean? The crucifixion? I don't see anything pleasurable about a crucifixion. I don't see anything to have joy about, by, about getting your nails, your hands nailed into a cross. Into a, come on now. But Jesus counted it joy. The joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. See, the OG said it like this. He said, oh, geez. Now, let me say this. I, I, some of you know I say this all the time. I'm just, I'm trying to help people out. It's, it's in love. If there's anything I say that you don't understand, Google it. <laughs> Google has everything. Right, Brother Pat? Where's Pat at? Google has everything. 
if I say anything, you could come and talk to me after service. It's all good if you don't understand a word I use. But most likely, Google will help you out. All right? That's just my disclaimer, man. That's, I just have to do it. OGs. Anybody know what an OG is? OGs got wisdom. Or they think it's wisdom, but really it's just information. It's not really wisdom, because half the stuff OGs tell you is stupid stuff that gets you in trouble. Some of my folks know what I'm talking about. OGs, okay? OGs used to say something that was actually on point in the context of these trials and things that we go through. It's not about if or why, but when. But when. And OGs would say this, and some of you might have heard it before. Baby boy, a mother or whatever, just live long enough. Just live long enough, and you'll see. It'll come your way. Just live long enough. And so you might have a good life, and everything's been all good, and things have just been smooth. Just keep on living. It's coming. Again, I don't say that to scare anybody, but it's just the truth. And part of the church's job is to do what? To equip the saints. Could it be the reason why people are committing suicide in churches? Pastors are committing suicide. Pastors. A high level of depression among pastors. These are the leaders. They're the ones that are equipping the saints. Forget about this that troubles will come. It's not about if or why, but when. If I understand the when, then I'll be prepared for it, amen? So James tells us to think about it as an opportunity. Now, let me say this. It hurts someone's feelings, but I'm just gonna go there, okay? I'm all aware of the abundant life. The blessed life. I read the book, The Blessed Life. It was good. <laughs> Nothing bad to say about that guy. It was, it was a really good book. I encourage you to read it. But can someone tell me where you, I could find in Scripture? In Scripture, not the self-help book you could find at Barnes & Nobles. And I'm not going to say any names of the self-help authors. I'm not going to go there today. But can someone tell me where I could find in Scripture where it says, The Easy Life? I know about the abundant life and the blessed life, but can someone tell me about the easy life? What book talks about the easy life? Because I'm afraid as a leader in the church, right, that many people are, are, are leading the saints, the sheep, astray by talking about this crazy easy life and how good your life is supposed to be if you know Jesus. Oh, if you know Jesus, life is going to get better. There's nothing in my Bible that told me it was going to be easy. And in fact, when he talks about the abundant life, the, the scripture that a lot of leaders like to quote all the time, did anybody remember what it said before that? You know, I'm going there. Someone say, read your Bible. Come on, tell this early, you know, wipe your eyes. Someone say, read your Bible. Now, the verse right before the abundant life, Jesus talks about the devil. Oh, did I say it? the devil in church? Is that a bad word? I feel like I'm in preschool class right now. Preacher said a bad word. The devil. He talks about the devil coming to steal, kill, and destroy. So before he talks about the abundant life and the good life, he warns us about the devil trying to steal, kill, and destroy everything you got. See, I'm not sure about you, but the devil has tried to steal, kill, and destroy me. That's why during worship, I'm on my knees weeping like a baby. And John John Cousin goes, are you all right, man? I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm good. I'm just, I'm crying because of how good God is. See, I have a letter right here from a, a person. I, I need to mail it off. That's why it's in my book. I'm just trying to remind myself I have a bad memory. That's another story. That's another story, my memory. But um, thank God for a real testimony like my boy right here, right? Underground, selling dope and ecstasy and just going hard for Jesus. I feel you, man. I feel you. We'll talk later. 
this guy I'm writing to is in prison for the rest of his life. Won't see daylight ever again without the chance of parole. And I think about my life. That's why I was crying, because God has been good to me. The devil has literally, and I could say literally, my wife was here, she would say amen. Had the, the devil has literally tried to take my family's life on multiple occasions. It has not been easy for us to get to where we're at today. Don't get it twisted. We're doing qu pretty good now. But we went through hell to get here. Someone say, take it easy. Tell the preacher, take it easy. I know I'm, I need to relax a little bit, huh? I'd be, be tense, intense. Hey, it's serious to me, though. It's real serious to me. This preaching thing, I don't take it lightly. No, my wife is right there. Amen? Amen. She like, yeah, we've been through hell. And I'm part of it. <laughs> You'll get that next week. So I just want you to understand, right? God is good. The abundant life is there for Christians, but... No one said it was going to be easy. We have to face troubles. We have to face trials. It's happened. And most people in this room have been there before. Been there. Done that. Been on the ups and downs of the roller coaster and couldn't get off. You had to just brace the ride. My hope today is to encourage the body to enjoy the ride. That in spite of the trial, in spite of the tribulation, in spite of the troubles, you can have joy. Amen. Now let's talk about James for a second. Someone say, read your Bible. It's interesting when you look into this guy, James. Dr. Nita's in the building. I feel, again, I feel ashamed again. She's like the leader of all character studies. She did this thing on, uh, on Peter, I believe it was. And so... Don't rebuke me later, please. I, I, I think I got this somewhere right. I'm going for it. James. James was the little brother of Jesus. Just let that sink in for just a second. Could you imagine being Jesus' little brother? Not really. Like, for real, that's G Jesus is my brother. Though. Like, you remember, like, getting get a fight on the yard and being like, don't have, don't have me get my brother. Oh, did any of y'all ever been in a, in a fight before in the yard? And like, you know what my brother is, though? Cannot really. Can you imagine getting down with, be, like, living with Jesus, though? Like, Jesus waking you up in the morning, though, for real? Like, just, man, I'm, I want to sleep. And Jesus is like, nah, it's time to get up. <laughs> like, you don't want to talk back to your, like, I talk to, I have an older brother, so I, me and him fought all the time. Stole stuff from each other. And I was like, but you can't do that to Jesus, though. <laughs> Can anybody, like, think of this practically, though? Like, this is really Jesus' brother, though. That must be difficult. Now that we understand James 1 now, the trials and the troubles, <laughs> just, just, just being Jesus' brother alone, like, just, that's enough right there. John, the seventh chapter. Now, what's interesting about James is, if I read my Bible correctly, I got Bible scholars all up in here, Portland Bible College, uh, uh, Patton, uh, top of the class in the building. So it's, this is challenging for me. Y'all pray for me, please. I got to be on point when I preach at this church. James wasn't a believer. He didn't come to believe in Jesus, his brother, can you imagine having to worship your brother, though? Like, <laughs> praise God. He's, like, in the building, though. <laughs> like, think about that, though. Like, that's, that's crazy. See, maybe my mind is just a little weird. I just, that's weird to me, though. So he didn't believe, understandably. Like, why would I want to worship my brother? So for 30-some years, he was an unbeliever. And Holy Spirit was in the house with him. That's crazy. Okay? John chapter 7, watch this. He didn't actually believe until the resurrection. Look at John chapter 7 in the first verse. 
After this, Jesus traveled along around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. How about that for wisdom? You'll catch that later. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the the world. Watch this verse right here. For even his brothers didn't believe. Isn't it interesting when you talk about trials and troubles? They start right at home. It's real quiet in here. Can I borrow an amen, Brother Hav? Oftentimes, our hardest struggles, our most intense trials, is right in our house. I hate to say it like this, but I just want to expose it just for what it is. It's so true. And I got like seven people saying amen, but I know most of y'all really feel me. But it's like kind of hard to really swallow that. That when you look around, it's not the outside that gets you. And if anybody can remember when you first got saved, it wasn't like a bunch of other people. It was the people closest to you. It's interesting that the people that hurt you are the people you love the most. Jesus, his brothers, can't you imagine he loved them? Talk about he loved the world, but how could he love his, his brothers? They never believed in him. Isn't it interesting that you try to change your life, you try to do something for God, but people don't believe in you? Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about because you had two parents in your home. You had a a circle of community of support, and you know what it's like to be encouraged. But some of us in this building today, nobody believed in us. There's some of us in here, nobody believed in. You're going to be a failure. You're going to be just like your daddy, just like your mama, just like your cousin. You're going to be, I'm going to be writing you one day. Been there. Didn't believe in him. This is the trouble I'm trying to get you to understand. It's right in the house. Got some married people in the building. I'm not going to look around. I've been married for nine years, going on 10. And sometimes it's right in the house. And I'm pointing at myself at my wife over there. I forget, we keep forgetting she's over here. I got to get, I got to get my. She's right over there. See, you, I got a sister, that's my wife, right? She'll throw something from right there and knock me right in the head <laughs> without blinking twice. She has a boomerang in her pocket, in her, in her purse right now. Mace, it's all in there. I got to go home to that. Y'all pray for me. I am abused, y'all. <laughs> nah, truth be told, it, it, sometimes it's me, right? It's both of us. Two imperfect people trying to come together to be one. That is very difficult to do. Amen, Mary people. That is very, two sinners, two fallen people trying to make it, trying to live for God together, trying to become one and raise kids. Lord, help us. Can I just keep it real, though? Divorce is just as much as, much in the church as it is out there. That shouldn't be that way. Because we should know how to face our trials. We should know how to endure hard times. Because marriage is like a roller coaster. Literally. You can't get off. Let me move on, please. I only got three more hours. Dang. (laughs) She said it's a revival. (laughs) Uh, All right. So James didn't believe. Just like some people in our own house, right? And it's interesting as you read about James, you come to Acts and you look at some stuff in Corinthians. He actually likely didn't come to believe. Hope I'm right, Dr. Nina. I hope I'm right. Till he saw Jesus after the resurrection. Isn't it interesting how some people don't believe until they have to see something? 
What happened to the believers that walk by faith and not by sight? It's, it's, could be some of your trials is because you're not walking by faith. You're waiting to see something. Can you imagine how, how much better James' life could have been if you would have believed 30 years ago? You'll catch that later. But he had to wait to see something. You got to wait to move. God's telling you to do this and do that. And you're saying, no, I got to see a sign. I need a confirmation. Come on, you know exactly what he's telling you to do. Could it be that we're, we're struggling in the trial because you're just... You don't have enough faith. And this is interesting because James was a Jewish believer, right? He observed the law. It's going to all make sense in just a second. He, he observed a lot of the law of Moses, right? So he held on to some of the tradition. But there was one tradition he couldn't hold on to. Faith alone. You can't hold on to the tradition unless you believe that we come to Jesus by faith alone, not by works. And James believed that. And because James believed that, y'all, he suffered. The religious people at that time didn't like him. And in fact, according to church history, he died for his faith. He died because he believed Jesus was the only way. And the only way you get to him is by faith alone. Mm -mm -mm. And he died. He died because he was a believer. We see this man, a guy here that is risking his life. And I've heard many people in America say on Facebook and everywhere else, I will die for the gospel. And this gospel rapper said it very good to this recently, Bizzle. He said, you know what? It's interesting that people talk about they would die for the gospel. Can I go there? I have already went there. I might as well just keep going, right? But people are not even want to be embarrassed for the gospel. You're going to die for the gospel. Not even willing to be embarrassed. So we're, trying, we're too busy trying to be politically correct. Don't want to hurt no one's feelings. Can you tell me in a verse, in, a, in the scriptures where Jesus cared about people's feelings? Amen, anybody. Will you, are you willing? Are you willing to die for the gospel? Are you willing to go through that level of trial where you would even be embarrassed, unashamed, lose a couple friends, lose some family? I've been there before for the gospel. Now that's James. Let's talk about us now. Let's go over to Romans, the fifth chapter. Someone say, take it easy. Now, when we're talking about trials, I want to deal with a few things. I want to deal with four lies of our trials. Four lies. Four lies the enemy tells us while we're going through it. When we're going through it. Anybody been through it before? Romans 5 and verse 20. And he says, where sin abounds, right? Grace abounds what? Much more. Lie number one. Here we go. I'm in sin and I'm being punished. Anybody been there before? Keep it real. All, all two, three of us, right? right? Like everybody's like, no, I've never sinned before. <laughs> Not me. I'm a good Christian. Not me. I've never done that before. Sin, not in my vocabulary. Let's keep it real. Many of us have fall, has fallen short and has, have felt like God is punishing you. And it's because of your sin, you're going through whatever you're going through. That is a lie. Can I, just, can I just expose the devil for what it is, right? 
That's a lie. Because where sin abounds, what? Grace abounds much more. Now he goes on to say, you know what? That doesn't give us a free pass to sin. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying, you cannot, the sin of the world already was on Jesus. PJJ said it best. He, and he told me this. And I see, I come from an old traditional church, y'all. And I was under condemnation all the time. I was in a church where the leaders of the church would often talk about when you do something wrong, God punishes you. This is what they would teach. And some of you know about that. Some of you know, experienced that before as well. And the, the pastor was teaching this. And it wasn't until I came and met uh, Pastor John John, and he told me this, and, he, and, I, and it, it was a process of deliverance for me, and he knows this. I, I, don't, I don't mind sharing my true story. I'm, I ain't nothing to hide with me. I was under that condemnation all the time. I always felt like, man, I did something wrong, or God's punishing me for this or that. And, G, and PJJ told me like this. He said, look, God doesn't need to punish you. He already punished his son. He has no need to punish you when he put all the punishment on his son. Ain't that deep? So why do we have that in our mind? Oftentimes, right? God is paying me back for what I did. And I know Christians, right? Right? No one really believes in karma, right? Karma is coming down on me. That's real quiet in here. You just read that horoscope and you were trembling. Ah, see, the the horoscope, he's going to leave me. (laughs) I'm just keeping it real, man. But you Christians don't read horoscopes, so. Oh, Jesus, help us. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Jesus doesn't need to punish you. He, He took the punishment for himself. And it's done on the cross. If anybody believe that, go in and just say amen one time. Ain't that good? I got some better news for you, though. Actually, it's not better news. I'm I'm lying to you right now. It's it's not good news. Because there's a book called Proverbs. And it does talk about bad choices. So let me be clear. God doesn't punish you, but there are choices that we make that are not biblical, that have nothing to do with God, that we have to pay for it. You don't have to say amen. It's okay. But it's the word. (laughs) Folly. Bad choices. Bad decisions. Sometimes we do have to pay. Sometimes we are a result of our own mistakes. But I want you to be clear today. The lie is it's not God punishing you. Sometimes it was you. (laughs) Help us, Jesus. Lie number two. I'm going to get out your way real quick. Anybody been here before? God doesn't care about me. You're in the trial, you're in the pain, you're suffering, and you just, just, it seems like God doesn't care. Anybody been there before? (laughs) Do we got any real people in the house? (laughs) See, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, right? I had no one telling me Bible verses. Frankly, I had really no family. The streets raised me. And the streets are brutal, if anybody know about that. There's no law out there, right? And oftentimes, what what I thought was care was what was going on out in the streets. Selling drugs, doing, robbing people, stuff like that. I thought the way I showed I care for my homies, right, was go and do crazy stuff and hurt other people. But I come to find out that hurt people actually hurt other people, right? So we're a bunch of hurt people out there hurting a bunch of other people, right? Thinking that we cared about each other. But risking our lives going to jail every day. That's why I was crying on my knees. Two of my close relatives are in prison right now. And I just know, I just know because I was out there. That could have been me. I could be doing a life sentence right now. You, none of you would know me. Except for a few of you, like, oh, you knew me back when he was in middle school. You probably would have been right at me, though, right? I think so, off top. But the lie is from the enemy is that God doesn't care about you. First Peter, the fifth chapter. Let's go. Got a few more verses. Anybody being blessed yet? 
I hope so. First Peter, the fifth chapter and the sixth verse. And it should be popping up on the screen in a second. Someone say God cares. Someone say God cares. Sometimes you just got to just hear that, right? It's just like when you get a hug. Anybody been just going through it and you just get a hug and it's just like, I needed that. I needed that. Sometimes when we're going through our trials and our troubles, sometimes you got to be reminded, you know what? God does care. It hurts right now. It don't feel good. Nothing feels good about a trial, but he cares about you though. That's good right there. First Peter chapter five, verse six. He said, therefore, humble yourselves. I'm reading from the New King, James, New King James Version on this particular verse. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in what? Due time. Someone say, take it easy. In what time? Due time, right? Ain't that our culture? We just want to rush everything. We want to rush our trials. We want to jump off the roller coaster and not break our leg jumping off. Microwave generation. We want it quick, fast. Get me in, get me out. Do what you want to do, God. But really, I really want you to do it like in a day. Help us, Jesus. Give me a husband. Give me a wife. I didn't, I didn't say that in here. I didn't say that in here. Give it to me now. Now, God. This is what I was thinking about. I was praying yesterday. Help us, help us, please. This generation just got it. This is all messed up. Lord, give me the desires of my heart. And your desires, they got nothing to do with God. But you want all of them though, right? And then got, got nerve to be mad at God because he don't get, help us, Jesus. Lord, give me the desires of my heart. And then you mad and crying when you don't get what you want. But what, what your desires should be is what he desires. Help us, Jesus. Because if you desire what he desires, your desires will come to pass. And you will be fulfilled. Like James said, you will be complete. Part, part of what's wrong with this generation is everyone feels incomplete. Because they ain't got a man or a, or a woman. They don't have a family. They don't have this. They don't have that. They don't have money. They don't have a job. Everything is incomplete. Because of a bunch of material things. Can I preach, Hav? If it's just me and you in the building, I'm going hard, right? Incomplete. The Bible's clear and saying some things will happen in what? Due time. Someone say, take it easy. In due time. God does care. Watch this. Casting all your care upon him. Someone cast it on Jesus. Why would you cast it on Jesus? The following verse tells us, because he cares for you. That ain't that something? We got a God that cares so much, he will allow you to cast all your burdens, all your trials, all your troubles onto him. That's a good God if I see one. That you don't have to carry it alone anymore. You don't have to walk through this life and on this bumpy roller coaster all by yourself anymore. You have a two-seat roller coaster and Jesus is sitting right next to you. He's with you the whole time. And he, you know what? He's not just with you, but he cares about you. He loves you. And it hurts right now. It's hard right now. You can't seem to find your way. But I want to encourage somebody today. He does care about you. Even though the devil was lying to you in the other ear saying, you know what? See, if God cared about you, this wouldn't be happening right now. If God cared about you, you wouldn't be so broke. If God cared about you, you would have a husband by now. If God cared, can I, can I just be real? Can I just be real? If God cared about you, your marriage wouldn't be like this right now. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Cash your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares about you. Someone say, take it easy. You have a reason to take it easy because he cares. You have a reason. I'm not trying to tell you life is going to be easy. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is the way to make, uh, Jesus help me, to make the ride a little bit easier. But you're going to be on the ride. But the ride will be smooth with Jesus because the yoke is easy. Come on. And the burden is light. I'm in the Bible now. Don't rebuke me, Hav. Come on. And isn't it interesting who wrote this? the apostle Peter. Don't you think anyone knows about the care of Jesus like Peter? 
Can I explain if you don't? Someone say, read your Bible. Peter's an interesting guy. He's the guy that denied Jesus three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. That's, that's, that's pretty tough right there. To deny the one that's done so much for you, who showed you miracle upon miracle, and you deny him. You, you, you can only imagine by reading the scriptures that, that this hurt Peter a lot, right? Peter was really hurt by this. He really was ashamed of himself because he denied Jesus. He knew as soon as that, that rooster crawled, just, oh, dang, I messed up. I messed up. Anybody been there before? You right in the middle of your sin. He just, oh, dang, I just, I knew I shouldn't have went over there. It's real quiet in here. Why y'all act like y'all ain't never sinned before? Why are y'all acting so holy and saved? Like, I get the most awkward this silence when I say something about sin. That shouldn't be the case. I'm just keeping it real. I forgot. Okay. Maybe because we're it's in San Francisco, it's like a perfect church. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. We'll talk about this in our Thursday meeting, man. I'll, I'll figure this out. You guys are all holy and stuff. Now... Peter knew about messing up. And Jesus, even while he messed up, he came and comforted Paul, uh, Peter. So when, G when Peter writes about casting your care on, on Jesus because he cares about you, wouldn't we understand if we read our scriptures that he understands about trial and trouble? He understands that the, he understands the care that Jesus has for us. It comes from a place of hurt. If, I, if, I, if I'm trying to get, get somewhere, Peter talking about casting your care comes from a place of needing care. Right. See, you wouldn't know about casting your cares if you've never had a care to cast. Francis, says, Francis Chan said it like this, too, too many people don't deal with the Holy Spirit, the comforter, because we're so comfortable. Ain't that the truth? Everyone wants to be comfortable, relaxed, and just kind of have an easy schedule. Just, you know, get by. No need for the Holy Spirit. No need for the help of the Holy Spirit because you're never in, oh, help us, Jesus. You think you're not in trouble, but really your complacency is really, it, 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 you need help. I'm moving along. The fourth and last lie. This is a crucial one right here. Again, for someone that grew up without a father, this is crucial. This is crucial. I have to fight this all the time. Is this lie? God is abandoning me. God is abandoning me. I remember going to the encounter retreat and, and John John, you know, he came in, gave me a hug. And see, some of you that ain't never been through nothing don't know what this is like. But I'm gonna just keep it real and speak from my pain. And he gave me a hug, and I was sharing this with Hav, and I and I try to encourage Hav all the time, though he thinks I <laughs> He thinks I hate on him. That's a whole nother. We're going to talk later, Hop. He thinks I'm a mean guy. He, John John gave me a hug. And this, 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 this to some main be like, this is stupid. What's, what's, it's not that serious. Take it easy. <laughs> but it meant a lot. He gave me a hug and he said, man, Marquise, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. And I just broke down. I don't know if you remember that. I was like. And I didn't know what was going on. I was like, what the heck is ah, crying? <laughs> Give me the whole bucket, box of tissue. Just, I was just, just taking all the tissue and just weeping like a baby. All he said was he was proud. Because for so long in my life, I was abandoned. No one was there. Brother in prison half, of, half my life, literally. In and out of jail. And just the streets. And it always feels, anyone who's ever ran the streets before, often you feel abandoned because you really have no sense of security. If you're looking for weed, you're looking for alcohol, you're looking for all these different things to try to help this feeling of loneliness and pain. And often as Christians, we use church like a drug. Help us, Jesus. You're lonely, you're abandoned, you, you, you're suffering, and you come to church trying to get a fix. It's not a fix you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus. Hebrews, the 13th chapter. I'm going to start closing this thing out. In 
most of us heard this before. Most of us heard this before, but I hope I could bring it in somewhat of another light. Hebrews, the 13th chapter in the fifth verse. Read it from the NLT. He said, look at this. And it should be on the, it's on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. <laughs> could this be the, this, the icing on the cake for most of our trials? And James spoke to this as well completeness be content with what you have most of the trials are self-inflicted trials because you want something that you were never supposed to have i've been there before looking at everybody else and what everybody else got why don't you look at what you have and be thankful for what you got be thank you see see what I teach, what I teach my kids every day we pray every day and I, and I said look if you don't pray nothing you better pray a prayer of thankfulness see if you've ever lost your life multiple times you know exactly what I'm talking about I just I'm thankful for the breath I breathe every single day John John knows me by now that, that's some real stuff right there I don't be playing with God God thank you for this breath right now because I should be dead right now and he says look. Look at this. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what? What you have. Someone say, take it easy. Someone say, look at somebody else and just tell them and tell them in faith. Take it easy. You got enough. See, see, so though sometimes it feels like you don't have enough. You need more. Can I challenge somebody in the church today? What more are you really looking for? And I, can I challenge somebody today? The more you're looking for will likely lead you to more unsatisfaction because you'll get that thing you'll get that woman you'll get that man you get that car you get that house and you st it's still not enough it's not enough so be satisfied with what what you have and watch this watch the connection here because what you have for God has said I will never fail you I will never abandon you because I want to challenge somebody. I don't say this by like Christian knees, like just say it to say it, but God is enough. I've come to find out when I didn't have nothing, when I didn't have two pennies to rub together, God was enough. That's why I was here and crying, crying like a baby and God knows holding me. I'm like, dude, I'm just so thankful. I may not have a lot right now, but I have God. And that's enough. I know Jesus. That's enough. Stand to your feet, please. If I could ask Rachel to come to the keys. He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you. He told the disciples in the, in, in the last book of the Matthews and a couple of other gospels, you know what? Go out to the world. Do what you have to do. Preach the gospel. And I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can't help but think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the middle of the fire, Jesus was right there. Not just like outside the fire saying, I'm going to cool you down when you get out, but I'm in the fire with you. And someone today needs to understand that in your trial, in your fire, he is right there in it with you. He didn't go nowhere. Though it feels like he went far away. He didn't go anywhere. A little extra tip for your, your Twitter feed. God doesn't owe you an answer either, by the way. Aren't we always looking for an answer? Like we go through a trial and like, God needs to explain to me why I'm going through this right now. I got three people feeling me that know exactly what I'm talking about. God needs to explain this. He, I, he needs to write, he needs to write in my journal and tell me why. He needs, and I'm going to open the Bible. I'm going to I'm just, I better get an answer. Yeah, I've never been there before. And he don't owe you an answer. He doesn't owe you an answer. You know why? Because he is the answer. Because when you got Jesus, you don't need extra answers. He's enough. Two keys as we close. Two keys. Number one, when we look at Matthew 11, we look at James 1. I want you to just get these two. I know there's many more things you can add to this and prayer, fasting, all these different things to deal with trials, dance, and praise your way through. I heard it all. Praise your way through. I love that one. That's so good. Praise your way through the trials. Two simple things. Let me give you real quick. Right after James talks about the trials, he talks about wisdom. 
getting wisdom. People of God, I, I, I assure you, I'm just by testimony, get wisdom. And you know what's so funny about wisdom? Is he gives it to all who ask. He doesn't hold it back. And if you don't have wisdom, the Bible talks about being unstable in all your ways. Anybody ever been unstable before? Amen, anybody just unstable, just not rooted, not grounded? Can I, can I encourage somebody today? It's probably because you were lacking wisdom at the time. Just wisdom on the under. See, the world has a lot of information, but it is lacking wisdom. Information is at our hands. Wikipedia, Google, all these different things. You can find information. You can find information about anything. But the world ain't giving you wisdom because wisdom comes through experience. And wisdom comes through knowing Jesus. And lastly, church, second key right here. Back at Matthew 11, you know what he said? Come to me. Come to me. And when you look at that word in the Greek, come on, PJJ, you know this. He's like yelling. He's saying it aggressively. Come to me now. Why is it in our trials oftentimes that he's the last thing we go to? Why is Jesus the last resort? That is crazy. Does anybody need to come to Jesus? That's it today. That's, all I, that's really all I got for you today. Get wisdom. Ask for wisdom. Understanding. And just simply, I don't, I don't have like a deep theological essay for you today, but just come to Jesus. That's my experience. When I was going through hell, I just went to Jesus. When I didn't know if my marriage was going to make it another day, I went to Jesus. When I was broke and didn't know where I was going to get the next meal from, I went to Jesus. And I say that in the most literal sense. Anybody knows me, Hob has been there, walk with me many times when I didn't have nothing. And God has provided as I went to Jesus. I didn't go back to the streets to sell dope. I didn't go steal from nobody. I went to Jesus. And every time, church, I said every time, he will provide. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. In closing. If you know you've been through a trial, you've been through a storm, you've been through a hard, difficult time, you've been through the fire, I ask you just to be really bold and just, can you come up here with me? Is that okay? I know it's like a little bit past our time. Can you come up here with me? If you've ever been through it and you just, just need to come to Jesus, amen? I just, just let me know I'm not alone. <laughs> Don't abandon me, church. Nah. I'm not trying to pressure anybody to coming up here at all. This is like he said, it's not no timeshare. This is real. If you can honestly say, you know what, I need, I just need Jesus. Don't give me a bunch of extra advice. Don't give me a self-help book about seven steps to a better life and an easy life. I don't need all that. I need Jesus. Because that's been my story lately. Some of you know, I got, I got fired. Y'all got laid off out of nowhere. That was hard when you know you got baby number four on the way. Like, God, what you doing? How you gonna, God, how you gonna let this happen to me? I was going through it, y'all. Didn't go one day without work. The day I got laid off, I got laid off on a Friday, y'all. I was working on Monday. Ain't that God? Ain't that God with a race? I ain't, I ain't gonna get an amen right there. Don't no hate on her, brother. They're just trying to climb the ladder too. That's all right. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands, church, right where you're at. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you right now. Jesus, I have some friends with me right here at the altar. You see their heart. You know their name. You care for them. You know them well. You know them better than anybody in this church knows them. And God, you love them. You care for them. You know their struggle. You know every specific trial. You know it, God. And God, we pray right now. You touch the hearts. You touch every situation. You touch every trial, God, every trouble. Give them wisdom. Give them peace that surpasses all understanding. 
because they know you, Jesus. And some need you more even now. And some are in a better season of life and maybe not in the trouble right now. But I ask you to prepare and equip them, God, for the time to come. That they won't be tossed to and fro. But Jesus, they will be rooted, granted, hallelujah, grounded, God, planted in the church, hallelujah, with deep roots. Because Jesus, we love you and we declare City Life Church, we need you, Jesus. And that's just the testimony of this church. We needed you, God. We cried out to you, God. This didn't happen by some special plan, but by your work, Holy Spirit. So, God, I pray for these people, God, for your people, God. Be with us. Help us to understand the truth and rebuke every lie. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything you did, everything you're doing. And we're going to give you glory because you're good all the time. Thank you, Jesus. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Give him a praise. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Amen. Amen. God bless you. First 11 o'clock service. I hope it was good. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the day. Amen. And I'm going to pass it back to PJJ. Come on. The, the pastor keys are good today. Amen. Great preacher. I love it. Church should be a place where you come and you meet the reality of life and you leave encouraged that God is with us and he's for us. We make mistakes. Um, there are so many good nuggets that he said, and I, I, I was encouraged, and I am encouraged. Um, you know, one of the analogies when it comes to, like, the weightiness of life, God always does the heavy lifting. Oftentimes, we kind of shift places in that roller coaster ride, and we're trying to do the heavy lifting, and that's not our call. And, and it's true what, what Pastor Key says. All judgment was placed on Jesus at the cross. But I do think that the Holy Spirit still does bring correction and, help, and helps us to get back on track. Sometimes we're just on the wrong lane. And he just gives us a little nudge and says, hey, I'm going to help you. And it's not judgment, but it's adjustment. It's like a chiropractor. The Old Testament says that those who he loves, he chastises or he corrects. God brings guidance and he adjusts us. And sometimes it doesn't feel good, but it's for our good. It's for our benefit. The worst ones, though, keys in it true, it's the trials that we bring on ourselves. This, this knucklehead right here, I've had my share of boneheaded mistakes. And I go, what was I thinking? Gosh. Parked the car one time in front of the church. Here in the city, after 3 o'clock, they ticket you and they tow you. That wasn't a storm that God sent. That was my poor, you know, memory. I forgot. So, um, but praise God that God is there to comfort us and to help us and to move us on. God is good. We're going to have some announcements that we're going to roll. And, uh, and then our, our service will be officially dismissed. Thank you for going with the new flow here. And I think Sunday morning has been a good, a good call for us, don't you think? It's been good, huh? Amen. So tell your friends about it. Invite people to come to church. God's doing something crazy. Do we have our two-minute video announcements ready to roll? Check this out, and then we're going to be officially dismissed.